I suppose I just want to say hello and thank you for inviting me here tonight to AWARE. Um, I think I did a talk for AWARE about five years ago where I just purely focused on social anxiety. Oh God, I have a few people nodding in the audience, but are you here? I didn't frighten you off, you came back. I suppose that's a good sign at some level. Um, but this time I thought I might try to kind of bring it more into the ethos of, of AWARE with, with its more of a focus on depression and looking at the links between the two. Hence the title of, of, of the talk is Social Anxiety Getting You Down. Um, so what I first thought I'd first do would talk a little bit about social anxiety and what it is. Um, <clears throat> look at the links between social anxiety and depression. Um, try to understand those links and then maybe talk a little bit about some of the smaller kind of things that we might be able to do to alleviate both that will be useful for both. And then I believe I'll finish and you can, uh, at the floor will be opened up to questions. Okay. I think the best way of describing social anxiety is to ask somebody who has it. Um, and the first section of slides I have really are quotes from people um, who've been through it or in the process of going through it. I'm taking them verbatim. And they kind of cover, the various slides cover different elements of what it's like to have social anxiety. So what do people say? One individual described it as, for me, social anxiety is the excessive fear. And excess is important there because we all fear to some degree social contact. Um, certain social contacts are much more fearful than others, so doing something like what I'm doing right now would be probably top end for people in terms of anxiety provoking. But for others, even to kind of the idea of having a chit chat with somebody else can be a degree anxiety provoking, particularly if you don't know them terribly well. So the emphasis there is on excessive fear, dread, and nervousness. Experience in my relationship with other people, especially people in authority for this particular person, and people I don't know very well. I be very self conscious and don't feel at ease in social cir circumstances or situations. Self conscious there is another very key point, I think. In the words of somebody else, <coughs> I'm ill at ease around people that I don't know and find the ordinary social situations that everyone else encounters very difficult. And these can range from the simple thing of going to the market, to a job interview, to going on a date. Another individual described it as such. I have a fear in social situations that I will draw attention to myself. That's very key there. Make a fool of myself or that people will laugh at me. People might think I was very nervous or boring, or strange, or unusual. So the evaluation people make of me. Another comment was, when I see people I know in the supermarket, I make sure I don't walk down that aisle and try to avoid them. So I won't have to try and have conversation with them. We duck and dodge. Or while talking to people, I find myself blushing and always try to hide my face behind my hair. Hate the idea of people seeing me anxious. So they're the kind of real-life comments of people who struggle with social anxiety. And just to go to a little bit more to maybe we'll say the official version of what it is, or how it's particularly understood at this moment in time, it's defined as a marked and persistent fear. So marked and persistent. A one or more social situations or performance situations in which we, people, can be exposed to unfamiliar people or to the scrutiny of others. So other people will kind of observe us and come to certain opinions about us. And the person fears that he or she will act in a way, in other words, say or do something that might be silly, or show anxiety symptoms in the presence of other people, like blushing, and that this experience will be humiliating or embarrassing. So really, I often kind of think about it, it's a fear of embarrassment. And embarrassment is probably more the kind of key emotion that we're talking about when we talk about social anxiety. It's anxiety about being in situations in which we feel we'll embarrass ourselves. <clears throat> so act in a way to say or do something silly. And when we look at those kind of circumstances that that kind of occurs within, it, it seems to break down, in my experience anyway, it seems to break down into three major broad categories. And the first one is probably the more um, pervasive one. And it relates to something like as uh, simple as informal conversations. So small talk or chit-chat. And if you think of that, so much of our life and our communication with other people revolves around small talk. And the concerns within that are not just about coming across as silly, but also coming across as being weird or some way strange or odd or different or weak. 
So it tends to be three major concerns that I'll come across as not being very intelligent, being kind of silly, or being weird or strange in some ways, or being weak or inferior in some ways. For some people, it's all three. For some, it's more emphasised on one of those things. And clearly, if it's around chit-chat and small talk, that really impacts on a social life, the ordinary day-to-day kind of connections we have with other people. It also ties into the more formal conversations. And by formal conversations, I kind of mean conversations that have a focus. I'm engaged in a formal conversation right now. You know, I have a purpose, it's a focus of what I'm going to say. I've thought about it. It's kind of organised in my head. And there's lots of formal conversations that happen in our day-to-day life. Um, parent-teacher meetings, best man speech, board meetings, presentations, meeting the bank manager, meeting anyone in a formal kind of circumstances. Um, so they are also concerns. Probably don't impact as much as the chit-chat stuff, but still do, and probably more so on the job front. And then there's acting away, emphasising the do part. So this performance almost sense of things, doing something in front of others. And it often means, can often mean simply doing something in front of others where we're not actually having a conversation, we're not saying anything, but we're simply being observed doing something. Typical things that people would talk about would be things like writing in the presence of other people, <coughs> eating in the presence of other people, drinking in the presence of other people, or simply walking. Having other people observe us walk from A to B. Typing, having some, one witness some aspect of your physical work, looking over your shoulder, as it were, keeping an eye on what you're doing, playing sports, playing musical instruments in the presence of other people. Some of these things are more kind of understandable in some ways and quite much more common. Um, so I suppose performance in a classic sense, getting up on the stage and having to perform some kind of song and dance routine in the presence of other people, we'd all kind of acknowledge that that's probably kind of a high-end stuff to be engaged in. Um, for people often say that while I'm writing, it feels like I'm on a stage and everyone's watching me doing that activity. <coughs> what are the other em- aspects of it? The show anxiety symptoms. So anxiety itself almost becomes the enemy. We can't let it be seen by anyone else. So any anxiety that can be seen or hear tends to be the ones that mainly concern us. Um, and often, in my experience anyway, is the major reason people come seeking help. So it's the obvious stuff, the blushing, the sweating, the shaking, be the hands or the knees or the voice, the mind blank, forget what to say, someone asks you something, suddenly, whoop, nothing up there at all. Muscle tension, dry mouth. The internal stuff also bother people, but not quite as much. The heart rate, those kind of things, the stomach, the churning. It's unpleasant, but at least people can't see it. And if people can't see it, then they can't come to conclusions about you. And exposure to these kind of situations almost invariably, not always, but almost invariably provokes anxiety, which may go to the point where it kicks into a panic attack, which is something slightly different. Um, I won't really get into the idea or or the concept of panic attack just at this moment in time because it will divert me off too far from um, what I want to talk about tonight. Other important things is the person recognises that the level of fear they have is excessive. We recognise within ourselves, I shouldn't be feeling this anxious in these circumstances. And in fact, it's that part of it, that I shouldn't be feeling anxious in this kind of circumstances, is, it, is, it, is where a lot of the stress comes around. Um, <clears throat> so we recognise it's excessive or unreasonable. So we're often our own worst enemy in this kind of context. We give out to ourselves for being this way in the presence of other people. And a feared situation, be it social or performance, are avoided. So we get great at avoiding stuff, simply not going. Or else, for various different reasons, we might find that we have no choice but to go along. There might be a sense of duty, obligation, uh, a sense of shame about missing it so often before, that we go along anyway. And we simply endure the whole experience with intense anxiety and distress. And simply can't wait for the whole thing to be over. So this kind of avoidance the anxious anxious anticipation and the distress tends to impact in a broad areas of our lives. Um, So our normal routine, um, our occupational academic function, our social activity, our relationships, and there is marked distress about having having this anxiety in the first place. So to summarise that, social anxiety is the excessive fear of being judged 
negatively. Now, if I just hold off a second there, just, that makes sense, judge negatively. We're beginning to think about it now, we're beginning to listen to people now, and I don't know if it's a particularly Irish thing. <laughs> but we also find some people with the same kind of concerns of being judged negatively also fear being judged positively. Hate getting praise. Kills them. And we haven't quite figured out what that is, um, that drives that. We have a sense in some ways that if I get praised now, the expectation of people for me in the future is going to be higher, and I'm going to have to raise myself up to that level, so please don't praise me, so I don't want to have to up my game in some ways. Or we somehow kind of almost assume that the praise is false praise. They're just being nice. They're just being kind of, kind of, and they want something from me. And that's the only reason they're saying this. They're not genuine in their praise. And therefore we struggle with it at some level as well. When we finish the if you any other ideas about that, I'll be all keen because it's an area I'm particularly interested in. So we fear being judged negatively in these kind of social performance situations. And at these situations, therefore, avoided, which makes perfect sense, or endured with considerable discomfort. So fear of judgment. And as I was saying a little earlier, when we feel that people are making a judgment of us, particularly if it's a public thing, there's a sense other people are a witness to that, we experience embarrassment, um, or possibly shame, or even humiliation. Didn't emphasise that area, I'll emphasise it again, it's an excessive fear, because some level of anxiety in social situations at times is very normal. I can explain that out in some ways that, whether we like it or not, um, in this world, there are certain people who are typically or can be more judgmental of others than others. And you know that yourself from your own life experiences that some people are very easygoing, they don't make judgments very quickly, the judgments they do make tend to be nice, and that's how they are by nature, and they're nice and comfortably around. But we also have met people where, who will be quite judgmental in their, in, their, in, their, in their statements. And because they exist, a certain level of anxiety makes sense in social circumstances. How common is it? <clears throat> you only have to go back about 30 odd years. In fact, 30 odd years ago, it wasn't even recognised as something. And when it was first noted or muted that it could be a, 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 a circumstance that people found particularly difficult, the kind of prevalence rate was the fancy term we use. How frequently does this occur in the, in the, in the population in one's lifetime? It's typically how they use that. They talked about maybe being one in 20,000. In the last 30 years, that has gone from one in 20,000 to quite a variety, of, um, if you look across the world there, anywhere from 0.4% in Taiwan to 24% in Poland. Who would have thought the Poland was so anxious, the social nature? Um, a lot of those kind of studies are a little bit iffy in terms of how accurate they are. There is certainly a sense that there is more social anxiety exists in cultures where individualism is kind of emphasised. So Europe and USA and Australia and New Zealand, where we kind of, we focus on individual achievements and individual freedoms. Countries like Taiwan and China and Japan, where there's a much more kind of a community-based, where we, we're there less as individuals, more as community, it actually seems to be less and actually seems to be quite different in its expression. So in the Western world, we make a mistake. We're embarrassed for ourselves. We don't want you thinking I'm a, an absolute idiot for making that mistake in the first place. That's where our concern is. Where in somewhere like China and Japan, they make a mistake, they're more concerned about they've offended you by their mistake. They're more concerned about you and the offence you might have taken from what I've done rather than about themselves. Just a subtle difference between cultures. Probably the best study out there is the one in America. They'd always have the best one, I suppose. And that would suggest a lifetime likelihood of having social anxiety is nearly 13%. With at any one time, nearly 8% struggling with social anxiety. That's one in 14, which is quite, quite a lot. We have a kind of an Irish study here going on, which talks about 14%, pretty much and the same as the Americans. Um, I know other studies that look at Americans as well will say that, you know... <coughs> Nearly 60% of Americans would define themselves as shy. I you know, for me, the idea of a shy American almost seems a contradiction in terms, but there you go. Um, but looking at our own kind of figures, it would almost say that one in eight Irish adults are struggling with 
a level of anxiety that might be considered clinical at any one point in time. It kind of makes it the third most common emotional difficulty that exists, which has gone from almost not even mentioned or named 30 years ago to the third most common one, um, only after depression <coughs> and alcohol misuse. And in some ways, I think those three major ones are very, very interconnected. In this country, when we're feeling a bit anxious about going out to a social circumstances, what do we do? We have a few drinks. <laughs> we get the Dutch courage. And I certainly know, having talked to people in the AA, they will often will say, you know, they probably started their drinking career. And if they think back to it, it was probably based on social anxiety and they used alcohol to manage that and then the alcohol got out of control. And it became the primary kind of thing that they had to deal with. They'll often talk when they eventually get to the far side and they go drive for a while, what's there waiting for them? Social anxiety. The very reason that they went through that whole process in the first place. So when does it start? It's kind of unclear about this, but they'll say about 80% of people will already have it by the time they hit 20. Certainly late teens. Interesting though, when you think of it, when do people actually come looking for help? Approximately 30 years of age. So we're very, very slow to go forward looking for help with social anxiety. Typically 10 or 12 years before we'll actually go looking for help. And just keep that in mind when I come to talk about depression in a moment. This idea of 10 to 12 years before they come. So on average, people, for me, and the work I do, will be around 30. Um, <coughs> most anxiety sores, hate to say it, um, tend to be, we tend to see it more as a female thing. Most males have our own issues. We've got plenty of other nasty stuff over the other side. Where this one is kind of unusual, figures kind of vary, but it's much closer to 50-50. And again, I think if you think of it, in our current modern cultures, um, <coughs> I suppose it's changing, but the male, if the male is the, had been traditionally the kind of the breadwinner, and if social anxiety interfered with our job, that would provoke them to go looking for help, or if it interferes with their capacity I suppose to get into a relationship with a female, that the whole, that whole ordeal, again, those things are changing, thankfully, but traditionally, I think that was probably more a male thing, um, and which may explain why they, they're more likely to come looking for help with social anxiety. All the other anxiety males hide. They don't go forward, really, with that. What type of people? Anyone. How long does it tend to last? They say 25 years. Um, do we kind of grow out of it? Do we get to a point in older age, I suppose? They say one of the graces of getting older is that we don't really care about what people think so much anymore. That happens to hopefully most of us. <laughs> I think there are always a cohort where that will continue on and it will kind of uh, continue to exist there. Um, <clears throat> however, the on uh, onset after 25, we're unlikely to develop if we're okay up to the age of 25. But that does occur occasionally. Now, the relationship with depression... The figures again change and vary, but approximately three quarters of people with social anxiety will also go on to develop a major depression episode at some point in their life. That rate gets even higher as we get older. Of all the anxiety disorders, it's estimated to be the most common co-occurring anxiety order with depression. So the ones you're going to get most likely connected with each other is social anxiety and depression. When they co-occur, which they do so frequently, the prognosis becomes more problematic. And unfortunately, the rates of kind of suicidal ideation, suicidal acts, and suicide itself increase. So they're not a good mix. And here, thinking back to earlier, in the vast majority of cases, depression will develop after social anxiety is set in. How long after? 13 years. So it's typically, by the time people go looking for help, depression has kicked in. And often what happens when they go looking for help, they go with depression. Where the anxiety, which may have driven it from the start, kind of gets hidden behind it. So of all the various kind of difficulties we present with, social anxiety tends to be the ones that's most missed or underdiagnosed or underrecognized. That makes sense? Some things it's not. It's not just shyness. There's a lot of debate out there in some ways. Um, shyness and social anxiety are probably better seen as a continuum 
from normal levels of social anxiety or anxiety in social situations up to shyness and then into social anxiety. And we probably really start calling it social anxiety rather than shyness when it really begins to interfere with our functioning, how we can actually manage our day-to-day -day existence. It's not introverted. Um, introverts choose solitary activity over social one by preference. They enjoy being on their own. Um, whereas socially anxious people avoid social encounters out of fear of embarrassment. I certainly remember one individual in some ways, to, dis to somehow describe the internal conflict that they experienced, talked about social anxiety being like, as they described it, I feel like I'm an extrovert trapped in an introvert's body. So I want to be connected with people, I just fear it. It's not like I'm, I'm happy to be on my own. I feel safer on my own, but I feel lonely. I want to be connected, but when I'm out there I feel anxious and distressed. So it's kind of caught between a rock and a hard place, being lonely and isolated, or um, anxiety-driven and embarrassed. And it's not a deficit in social skills. People with social anxiety, when they are calm and in the company of people who they are comfortable with, all the social skills you would expect are there. They don't need to be taught how to interact with people. It's just fear gets in the way. What causes it? A lot of debate out there about what causes it. I, just, I, I won't spend too much time on that. Are we born this way? It's a tricky one. Um, I like to think, of, I suppose, in some ways, and it's not everyone, that certain people are born with a greater degree of sensitivity, just inbuilt, a nervous system that's slightly more sensitive. We typically, in the past, had very negative ways of describing that. Highly strong, you know. Um, but if you really think of it, sensitivity is a great thing. If we, can, if we can somehow harness sensitivity um, with the kind of people who become our poets, our, our, our kind of artists, our architects, our creative people, but it also means that those people in the environment they find themselves in are more likely to experience kind of distress at the same time. So it's a kind of tricky one in some ways. My experience of running groups with people and hearing what they say, um, common things you hear, well, clearly any experience of being evaluated in a very negative way in the presence of other people is probably central. The relationship with parents. The parents are particularly strict or, or, or um, how would you say, critical in their evaluations of what we're doing or what we're saying or what we're wearing. We can take a bit of that, that's absolutely fine, but over time, if there's an excessive amount of that, that can begin to wear into us. Opportunities for social learning. Again, if we're very rural or we're moving around from A to B and we don't get the chance to sit very long or over a period of time with other people, um, to feel comfortable, to get a sense of kind of how we fit in, can, ho can happen with that. Coping styles, again, how the family copes with distress. Do they withdraw? Do they isolate themselves? Or do they go forward and try and manage it? Again, the withdrawing, isolating kind of coping will be more associated with social anxiety. I've highlighted what I probably see as probably the most significant one, and I know it's very kind of uh, common uh, uh, and of concern, um, but kind of traumatic experience. Uh, I would say about 70% of people who go through the program I run have some kind of experience of bullying, be it in the family, on the street, or within the school. And sometimes that can be really, really long and excessive. Again, it kind of makes sense if we're bullied by other people, the message we're getting that from other people is some ways what, who we are, what we're saying, what we're doing is somehow unacceptable. And it's made very clear to us that it's unacceptable. In those circumstances, if we're being bullied and we don't have support to somehow cushion that, um, can certainly make the whole experience worse. Transition periods, um, the demands of those, probably the key one is adolescence. Um, at some level, I almost feel that social anxiety, anxiety in social situations is almost a norm for adolescents. You know, kind of finding your feet, not how you fit in, not knowing how, how, how to organise yourself around other people. And what a lot of people say to me anyway, um, when they get to the 30 and they come to me, they're 30 years of age and they'll often describe themselves, I feel like I'm still an adolescent living in the, in the, in the adult world. I just don't, I still haven't found my feet as it were, within this. Feel, feel people are looking at us and judging me and laughing at, at what I am and what I'm doing. And then, I suppose, always the case is life stresses. 
major moves, important changes um, in job status, may or competition. Competition, going, finding, going to places where there's a lot of competition, um, a lot of edginess in, in some ways, where it's kind of kill or be killed. And um, those kind of environments, which are probably more common nowadays, um, don't have these kind of circumstances whatsoever. And we typically break it down into three phases, the before, the during, and the after. So the before phase is when you hear of a social circumstances coming up, a party, a meeting, a wedding, or whatever it might be, and you begin to think about it. You're not there yet, but you begin to think about it. And you think about it based on all the kind of social experiences you have up to that point in time. And if they haven't been very good, you tend to expect um, that it's going to be difficult. So you start predicting what might happen and expect it really to be a catastrophe of some description. So you start, therefore, planning for safety, which often means avoiding altogether. Or if you're going to go, trying to maybe organise that you go with someone who you feel safe with, or making sure there's alcohol available, or having an excuse to leave early, or finding a way to somehow be there, but not there at the same time, so to survive it. When you are there, the during, the embarrassing phase, as I sometimes call it, and the central belief within that is that the whole situation is dangerous. We know it isn't, at some level, at some intellectual level, but at a different level, we kind of, our body is responding as if it is. So at some level, we do kind of have a sense that the situation is kind of dangerous. And if they're dangerous, I'm going to have to do my best to be perfect. So there's a huge amount of kind of pressure we put on ourselves to behave in, an, in, in a socially kind of almost perfect way. Mistakes are not tolerated whatsoever. Because if mistakes happen, the consequence for acting in that way, in a mistaking way, um, is just too uh, difficult to contemplate. It's, it's kind of like the nightmare scenario. So we'll do everything when we're in, in our power to somehow avoid making any kind of mistakes. And you know yourself, the more pressure you put on yourself not to make a mistake, the more likely, ironically, you do. <coughs> so if we make a mistake and then it's noticed by others, the fair result is that in some ways they reject us, they won't consider us in the same kind of way, it'll be humiliating. So as I said earlier, it's ultimately one of fear of negative evaluation by others where the emotional component, how we feel in those moments, the beam me up Scotty moments, the moments where we want the ground to open up and kind of swallow us, is one of embarrassment. When that happens, we become incredibly self-conscious. In some ways, social anxiety is almost defined by self-consciousness. So when our attention, our awareness shifts where it should be on other people when we're in the social world, in towards ourselves. So we become hugely aware of all that's happening in our head and in our body, and it's very unpleasant. Plus, we lose track of what's going on around us, and the whole social world and, and interaction becomes particularly more difficult. We'd have lots of negative thoughts about our performance, and we particularly engage in what we call mind reading, which in some ways is a kind of a sense that if we think we're, be, we're, we're, we're performing poorly, we just make the assumption that other people think the same way and view us as performing um, poorly. So I think I'm boring. And what I'm saying right now, we make the assumption other people are thinking exactly the same way that we're boring. And that's a horrible circumstance to be in. We'll try our best to kind of hide, to save behavior within that, keeping a low profile and trying to survive or escape. And then afterwards, when you finally get out of there, if the situation was particularly embarrassing, um, some people can spend days and days and days and days and days ruminating on the embarrassing moment to the exclusion of all other things that happened on that particular night. They're full of should-haves, not getting better, self-criticism. And it's almost a despairing. It gets more despairing over time because things don't seem to be changing. And if the situation unexpectedly ran smoothly, it goes a counter to what our expectations were. Do we own that? Unfortunately not. We attribute it to luck. Um, <clears throat> or a sense that we ducked and dived well enough. And we had a sufficient amount of alcohol on board. Um, and all we experience at a minimum is a sense of relief. But not a sense of it won't happen again. So how are social anxiety and depression somehow related? If you, 
think of it, social anxiety typically occurs first. 12 years, people come looking for help. 12 years later, typically depression begins to kick in. Why would depression kick in around social anxiety? Well, if you think of depression, or I, I think of it anyway, I think largely I have that kind of concept of loss, that we get depressed when we feel we've lost something that we kind of valued in our world. Um, and losses can be real losses or perceived losses or losses of, of, of ideals or losses of kind of expectations. So we may have had desire for having relationships that were comfortable and close, but because of that anxiety, it can undermine those relationships and we feel the loss of that. Because of all the avoidance where, where, where we have less social contacts, it's just easier for us to stay at home. And social contact is so vital for our mental health that we have social contact. So if we're not having that and we're, <coughs> we're just left at home on our own to brood, you can see depression begin to kick in potentially down the line. We all have a, a really strong sense of connection or desire for connection. We're very much a social animal. We need connection with other people. We do best when we're connected with other people. We know the people who, who live lives of hermits knock about 30 years off their life because of lack of connections. Um, but if we're continually avoiding, those connections can't happen or certainly are undermined. And our sense of belonging kind of diminishes. Things of love could be around career as well. That social anxiety often influence the kind of job that we take, how much social contact, how many board meetings, how many presentations. Um, and I've come across many people who, who refuse to take promotions because it would increase their kind of uh, profile in a particular place and they don't want that. Or loss of social activities, all the normal kind of fun stuff that people will do um, that gives them a sense of kind of relief and pleasure after a hard day's work doesn't happen either. So the huge themes of loss. If things don't change, it's hard to keep our optimism up. So pessimism can begin to kind of kick, kick in. That inability to see the light at the end of the tunnel. I'll never get any better. I'll be stuck with anxiety forever. You know, 12 years later, it's still there. It's hard to keep one's energy up for it. And pessimism and depression are very much two sides of the one coin. <coughs> A lot of self-criticism and self-blame and beating ourselves up. And making those comparisons. Everyone else is enjoying life and having a, a good time. Why can't I? Um, and we give out to it. We blame ourselves for that lack of ability. Comparisons. Comparison to, to others. Everyone else is having fun. And friends, they can have good except me. We make these negative comparisons. And there's a sense of paralysis can creep in as well. Feeling like we can't do things. I can't go to that party because I feel just too out of place and too uncomfortable. And again, so we're again not connecting in with other people. And I think over time, the combination of all of those factors can lead to a kind of a very understandable depression, a sense of lacking connection, lacking a sense of belonging, not, not having the kind of friendships and fun and social life that other people have, feeling powerless, making comparisons and beating ourselves up. So what can be done? Um, there's very specific things we can do, I suppose, about social anxiety, but I'm, I would kind of try to think about the very the kind of um, common things that might be very or important, I suppose, when we have both. Um, human contact is, I suppose, the obvious one to think about. We all need a certain amount of social contact to feel happy and content. Even introverts need a certain amount of uh, uh, social contacts. And if we don't get enough human contact, it's natural. It almost makes perfect sense to feel sadness and loneliness and even depressed. So hopefully, for someone who's in that kind of situation, there are at least a few people for whom you may feel a degree of comfort. And I kind of emphasise, make sure you rely on them for support. I know I have a, a, a strong sense that people have a kind of sense, well, I don't want to be a burden to other people, which I can understand. Um, however, if we're struggling and we don't reach out, I think, ironically, we become a burden to other people. 
we also remove the possibility of allowing other people to help us. And there's something very, I would just say, human and fulfilling about being able to help somebody else in need. And we remove that from other people. So I don't know if we, we can create, a, uh, we are really that much of a burden by relying on support, relying on connection for people who are maybe, we feel a bit more comfortable. And I encourage people, I suppose, to, to think about how they might gently, and I emphasise the words gently, increase their human contact, whatever might be out there. Clubs, community centres. I think the whole men, men's shed business has been a really kind of interesting and wonderful thing in terms of um, having people connect in some kind of way. Um, it's interesting again <clears throat> because, I mean, we get a certain amount of our activity through engagement with other people, getting up, going out, going and meeting people. Um, physical activity is involved there, um, and physical inactivity, um, ironically, is oftentimes a, a kind of a feature of social anxiety as well as depression. And we very much know that the less active we are, the more depressed we will feel. I probably shouldn't say this, but if you look at the research out there and you compare physical activity with any medication that's ever been invented to date, and you compare them side by side, physical activity wins hands down always. Um, now, saying that, there are a few little caveats I think are very important to consider when we talk about physical activity. And the first thing is, it needs to be physical activity that we have, how would you say, some interest in, that we at some level enjoy. So if you hate gyms and you say, my physical activity is going to go to the gym, you'll take away a lot of the benefit of the gym by hating it. <laughs> if you hate running and you choose to do running, it makes no sense whatsoever. You take a lot of the value away. You've got to be doing something that you actually enjoy. So trying to find a physical activity that you enjoy seems to really increase the benefit of it. And then the other thing they'll say, which again is a bit of a kind of a catch-22 for when we're struggling with social anxiety, is that physical activity that's engaged in the company of other people tends to have to really uh, benefit. So doing something you like with somebody else that's physical tends to be the real key thing in terms of addressing the kind of anxiety and the depression that kind of coexists in this kind of way. Um, it's, a hard, it's much easier to take a medication. It's a hard thing to kind of get moving, particularly when we're depressed. Um, I hear time and time again from people when they, when, when they get into that kind of depressed state, they talk about things like, I'll do it when I feel like it, when I'm up to it. Perfect sense. The problem with depression is motivation and activity do a flip. So under normal circumstances, when we feel like something, we go and do it. Grand. But if you hold that same expectation when we become depressed, we lose track of everything. Um, I don't know if you've ever been in circumstances where you really didn't feel like doing something, but you got yourself dragged out. You felt duty-bound to do it. So friends maybe are down in the bar and they kind of give you a call and say, are oh, you coming out? Oh, I don't feel like doing it. And yet you go and do it. Um, a lot of people will find a half an hour into it, whoa, <laughs> you're glad you came out, you're glad you started, <laughs> um, but you wouldn't have done it if you had left your own motivation. Um, I think that's an important kind of thing to think, that motivation when we're depressed tends to kick in after we do something, not before. The more organised we are about this, I think the better. So kind of the idea of maybe even writing out some kind of daily schedule um, by the hour, even half hour, of what you will do, when, You'll do it, and then sticking to it, despite how you feel. It's kind of difficult, but it's work. In many ways, we, we, you know, if, we, if our behaviour follows suit with how we feel, then that feeling simply intensifies and extends. So if we feel depressed and we do nothing, the doing nothing simply deepens our depression. If we feel anxious and we avoid, the avoid simply expands our anxiety. So almost that like we need to kind of act in a kind of mood independent way, that our mood doesn't count in terms of what we do. And when we then take control of what we do, the mood will in time follow suit. In time. It takes a bit of time for it to happen. So I'll, I'll emphasize there it's difficult, but it certainly does help. <coughs> a 
Here I'm talking about just any kind of physical activity, shopping, um, you know, anything at all. Exercise, so activity that actually gets your heart rate up a little bit, um, is particularly good for depression and anxiety. So the walk around the neighbourhood, even if it's on your own, if you need to, or with a dog, or whatever it might be, um, can be very helpful. Again, I'd go back to finding something you quite enjoy doing, or it's something that is a little bit more interesting to you, tends to work better. Maybe thinking of some kind of fun things, or non-anxiety provoking activities, and to fit it into your daily life. Stuff that doesn't necessarily elicit anxiety. Um, drawing, reading, listening to music, crossword puzzles, anything along that kind of line, um, will be certainly useful. And then you have this self-blame business. I think it's important to remember that no one chooses to have social anxiety and no one chooses to have depression. It's something that happens. And simply be giving, giving out to ourselves and saying we shouldn't have it, either of them, and being critical of ourselves for having it, um, really serves no useful purpose. On, we'd even say beyond that, it only serves to keep you stuck for longer. So the idea of trying to accept that it is what it is, you are where you are, um, be it depressed or socially anxious or both, and almost a sense of thinking about how you might treat somebody else who you liked, who was in a similar circumstances. And I like to think a degree of compassion would be in that. So this idea of, some, of trying to develop a, a, some degree of self-compassion as the little quote there says, be careful how you are talking to yourself because you're the only one that's listening. And when I hear sometimes how people talk to themselves, it's actually quite appalling. There is no way in a month of Sundays they would ever speak in a similar fashion to anyone, including people they don't like. <laughs> so self-compassion is kind of based on the idea that I, you're imperfect. Um, we all are. Um, but you're worthy, despite that imperfection. Remember I was talking about earlier, when we leave these social circumstances, at times we kind of, if, if things went okay, we don't take credit for that. We minimise it in some ways. Uh, it was luck, um, or it was the behaviour that I engaged in. Um, and when we look, think back on the, the, the night in question, we tend to just zone in on the very things that we did poorly and spin those in our heads. So it was a kind of almost a selective attention to that. If all we look at is our faults and we minimise any kind of qualities we have, you can just think of it, how over time that will erode into our sense of self. So finding ways to give ourselves a bit of credit for what we actually manage to do, however small that might seem. And I kind of sometimes, in, in some say, you know, some people say, oh, well, okay, I went to the shop, but that's no big deal. Should everyone goes to the shop? Yeah. It's no big deal to someone who's not depressed to go to the shop. Or it's no big deal for someone who's not anxiety-ridden to go to the shop. But if you're anxiety-ridden and you manage to go to the shop, that's a big deal. That requires a lot of the courage to work, to, to work through that anxiety and make it happen anyway. So it's a big deal when we manage those small things, when we've got that kind of burden on us. So... I kind of encourage people to make a daily list of this. Well, for me, I suppose, good with social anxiety for social accomplishments that they have, they have somehow managed to somehow achieve that day. And it's nice to begin to build up a kind of a kind of a, a journal or a kind of account of these things, particularly to use during times where we're kind of relapse back into this, focusing on our own, on our failures, something to somehow hold us for a period where we're kind of down a little bit more. And then this hopelessness. The, I'll never get any better kind of thoughts. And it certainly pops into people's minds quite frequently. I suppose it's knowing it's simply not true. Um, I know it sounds a bit twee in some ways. Um, but again, if you think of it, and, and, I, and I see it time and time again, when we get anxious and we get quite depressed, if I ask, begin to ask, what kind of thing are you listening to or attending to? People tend to be attending to kind of bad news stories. Um, it's funny in some ways. Like the, um, it would be like me in some ways working all day listening to kind of a lot of pain and then going and watching TV at home 
that involves a lot of pain. I go and watch comedy. I know that sounds terrible in some ways, but it's kind of, it kind of needs to offset what I've just heard in some ways. I, I don't mean in any kind of cruel way. Um, so success stories, I, I think in some ways, are, are great, be it in books or blogs or TED Talks or YouTubes. Something that some way can, can generate hope that other people have got out of this thing. I think Aware have done great work on that kind of idea of, of kind of flagging kind of how people have actually managed to kind of move beyond these kind of difficulties. And hopefully someday you become one of those success stories. Avoidance, particularly in either anxiety or depression, <coughs> um, is so disastrous. Um, we can use fancy words like an exposure hierarchy or a list of things. It's kind of like a ladder, I suppose, where we kind of ask people or maybe uh, ask people to consider writing down situations that cause anxiety in order of severity and then maybe aiming to perform the, the easiest one first. And I, when I talk about easy ones, I mean really easy ones. Um, tiny, tiny little steps are much better than the kind of the rushing that we might have. You might start by asking a change for direction, or you might simply start by sitting on, on a park bench and watching the world go by. Not even engaging, just observing. And, okay, at the very top end, you might decide to join Toastmasters and really push the boat out. Um, but within that, I think focusing on the actions achieved, not how you felt doing the actions. Because if you have the notion I should be doing this comfortably, we're going to fail. If I can just have a notion that I've done it, regardless of discomfort, we'll have achieved something. And that's important to kind of, because the feelings can often be quite different from what we do. So focusing on, our, on what we've done, the actions. And then probably much more specific to social anxiety is the idea of self-consciousness um, and trying to reduce that. Um, here the idea, I suppose, is trying to learn how to gain a little bit more control of our attention. Um, I'm sure you've come across the word mindfulness. It's out there everywhere. Um, there's quite a few things within mindfulness, but one of the things I like, particularly when it comes to something like social anxiety, is this idea of gaining better control of your attention. Um, mindfulness does that in a much more broad way but when I think of it in terms of what one of the key things that happen when we're social anxiety we go into the social world is there's a flip in our attentional focus from others to ourselves and anyone who's in those circumstances knows that's not a very pleasant place to be and the people who are comfortable around us if you actually just monitor where their attention is it's primarily external they're focusing out They've got control of that and they've focused out and occasionally it'll come in, but majority of times it's out. Trying to replicate that can often be a very, very useful thing when we're social anxiety. Trying to push your attention out, become fascinated by a world around us. Um, if it's simply just about listening and hearing and seeing and taking the pressure to engage out of that. As I've often said to people, you know, listening to other people is probably one of the greatest gifts we can give to other people. We don't have to say anything. Just paying attention and listening, I think, as a start, can be very useful. And I think, ironically, when we take the pressure off ourselves to say something, we actually think of things to say. Pressure, it's a bit like writer's block. The more pressurised we are to produce something, the harder it is to produce it. You can take the pressure off. I'm just going to listen. The chances are you'll have a lot more things to say. And if you think of it, people, when they're talking, will give you things to, to kind of respond off. You don't have to generate it up yourself. Just listen to what they're at. So this kind of overall idea that we can become more other conscious. Yeah, the self-help manuals out there to supplement things. Um, they can be good tools. They can be helpful in some ways. Um, only problem with self-help manuals, and I think this is very, very common, are they any good simply to read? Probably interesting. Do they help you? Probably not. <laughs> As you will find, it's even like cookbooks. How many cookbooks we'd buy and we never actually try a recipe? I think the same with self-help books. The problem with them is, and I've seen people with reams of them on their bookshelf. <laughs> They've read them all, and you ask them, have you done anything from them? No. So don't buy one unless you're actually going to follow through what the stuff says. <laughs> um, but it gives, it gives it some time, little kind of uh, helpful things within that in terms of what they might say. If all else fails, you know, I think it's very important to say that step out from that and maybe go for professional help, be it individual, be it therapy, be it support groups. Um, it doesn't really matter, um, but I think it's an important thing to do. I'd like to finish just on a poem. 
again, I didn't write it. I'm not that creative. But it was written by one of our RM um, group members as part of her role play. She was going to do this in front of the, uh, uh, a, a, a number of people, about eight or nine people there. Uh, I just thought the words were nice and I think it, it captured the kind of journey that she was going through. And she, did, she, she titled it The Places I Didn't Go. The places I didn't go to, the people I didn't meet, the sights I've never seen, fears I couldn't defeat, friendships I've never made, compliments I've never taken, always being afraid, the words I've never spoken, songs I've never sang, food I've never tasted, friends I've never thanked, so much time wasted, dances I've never danced, Successes I've never flagged, risks I've never chanced, achievements I've never bragged. Sweating, mind going blank, blushing, uncontrollable shakes, speaking quietly, avoiding situations, heart pounding and dwelling on mistakes. Breathlessness, mixing up words, stomach and knots, mumbling, dizziness, dry mouth, panicking, head pounding, putting myself under pressure. I should be a quick thinker, confident and chatty, never giving myself a chance. I should look normal, calm and happy. Abandon safe behaviours, change my thought processes. Mind reading is unreliable. Some say it's just a guess. Focus on success. Trust more on what I know. Remember no one's perfect and confidence will grow. Sometimes let down my guard and try something new. Try doing something different. We all have a different view. Conversations I hope to share, parties I hope to go to, remember what's done is done, and there's so much more to do. Okay, I'll finish on that point. Hopefully.